very warm welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session, which is called Enabling Forest Landscapes to Score SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Now, in my household, my boys are, uh, this part of the world is extremely popular in my house at the moment for a totally different reason, mainly because of the amazing footballers tending to be generated and the incredible goals scored by the likes of James Rodriguez. Uh, this is a different type of goals we're talking about today, sustainable development goals. Um, and this session is co-organized by IID and C4. And uh, my name is Simon Millage. I work for IIED. And I'm going to be your moderator, or the, the panelist moderator, but also a host, a host in inverted commas, because this is designed to be a bit like a, a, kind, of, a kind of a chat show, I suppose. We could call it a chat show. We'll see if it's a hit. If it's a hit, this chat show, it'll uh, catch on. There'll be many more like it in Peru and elsewhere. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our panel today. I'll start from nearest to me. Paula Caballero is Senior Director for the Environment and Natural Resource, Resources Global Practice at the World Bank. Before joining World Bank, she was Director for Economic, Social and Environmental Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Colombia. And many of you may know her from that time because she was, of course, a leading voice and negotiator in international, several international fora, including UNFCCC and also the post-2015 framework. So we're privileged to have her here with us and, and share her views and respond to your views. Camilla, Dr. Camilla Tulman is director at the International Institute for Environment and Development and uh, previously to becoming director ran the organization's drylands program. Uh, she's an economist by training and has worked mainly in dryland Africa and agriculture, land, climate and livelihoods, mixing research, policy, analysis and advocacy. Mm -hmm. She's also the chair of the board of the International Center for Agricultural Research in the dry areas. We're very, very privileged to have today His Excellency Mr. Heru Prasetyo, uh, who is the head of the National Red Agency in Indonesia. Um, his very responsibilities include chairing the Global Red Partnership and developing the National Framework on Climate Change Mitigation in Forestry, Agricultural Sectors and Natural Resources. And previously, he served as Deputy of Planning and International Relations of the President's Special Delivery Unit for Development, Monitoring and Oversight and Secretary of the National Committee of the post-2015 development agenda. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Peter Holmgren, many of you uh, will know. If you don't, then uh, there are some question marks. He's the Director General of, the, of C4, Center of International Forestry Research, uh, prior to C4. And so he's, of course, responsible for this great event, largely. And prior to C4, he led the Climate, Energy, and Tenure Division at the FAO. And, uh, um, was also responsible in developing profile and coordination of FAO's climate change work and also contributions of FAO towards UNFCCC. So again, very diverse and relevant mm -hmm. experience for today. And lastly but not least, we have Ms. Sonia Maria Gonzalez, who is the Director General for Environmental Research and Information at Peru's Ministry of Environment. Uh, she was previously specialist in desertification and drought in the Director General for Climate Change, Desertification, and Water Resources, and has also participated in the uh, um, United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. So thank you again, panelists, for, for joining us today. I'd also like to introduce Ayesha Constable, who's here at the front. She is my partner in crime um, in being moderator. She'll be moving around during the event because we intend, whenever you have questions, um, after the initial presentations, please put your hands up and uh, she'll be moving around and helping to make sure you share your views and get engaged. And if there are also questions that arise through social media, um, she'll be picking those up and also relaying them to the panel. So, just as a very, very brief background, 2015, as we know, is a very special year, a special year in the context of uh, coming to an agreement on the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals, and also a new climate agreement. And as many of you know, of course, forests are central to both of those critical areas, uh, for, important from the perspective of climate change mitigation, adaptation, resilience, 
and of course that are very relevant to a whole range of sustainable development outcomes. And yet we still see that incorporating forests and forest landscapes can be a, can be a challenge. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be concerned about how to, uh, um, to, to improve their management. Um, we have the main objective of this session then is essentially how can the SDGs catalyze policy and practice that enables so-called goal scoring. The setting of goals is underway. How can they actually catalyze changes in policy, changes in practice in a transformative, universal and integrated manner? And we hope at the end of the session we'll have some very useful recommendations that can be taken forward in different ways to policymakers, negotiators involved in both practice, both uh, arenas over the next year and beyond, and particularly to feed into an outcome statement from this Global Landscapes Forum, which can be relayed to UNFCCC. In terms of process, we're going to have a brief five minutes uh, or so dis, uh, presentations doesn't seem to be working. There we go. Um, from the, our panelists who will share their views and perspectives and then we'll have uh, a focus on discussions um, we've got four guiding questions which will help lead the discussions through and uh, definitely an emphasis on all of you getting involved so at any point in time during that if you have not necessarily questions but your perspectives and experiences is what the panelists want to hear and they've expressly asked for that, so please, no shyness, hands must go up. And at the end, we'll ask the panelists also to have a quick wrap-up of concluding reflections. So there we are, that's, that's enough for me. I'd like to now hand over to um, Paula, please, to come up and give her reflections. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody, and many thanks to IED and other conveners and organizers of both the Global Landscapes Forum and this event. Um, I've been asked to do a little bit of scene setting and I would first of all like to remind everybody here that the SDGs were not a done deal. We barely made it with the acceptance of the concept at the very, very, very last quarter of an hour <coughs> in Rio and we barely were able to get agreement, not just on the concept but on the way forward. So I think that what came out of New York in July is actually quite miraculous. I don't think there's too many goals and targets. I think that it's the first time that an intergovernmental process produces metrics. The MDGs, as we all know, came from a very different um, source. So I think that what we need to do is really build upon that momentum that was achieved in New York. Um, what we are seeing is that metrics are in vogue and what gets measured matters. But my concern, and this was a concern that I voiced throughout the SDG process, is that the metrics will bring us back into the silos. And if you look at what was agreed, the text, the draft text from July and the final text in, July, in, in June, sorry, and the final text in July, what you can really pick up is that a lot of the interlinkages that were there in June were negotiated out of the text by July. So what I think is the real dividend of the landscape's context in terms of the SDGs is that it becomes a platform, a, a, it brings to the fore the fact that Development is about interrelated and interlinked issues with very complex trade-offs and externalities that demand these joined-up approaches that we've been hearing about. So yes, the SDGs, I think, can be a tool, but more importantly, how can landscapes be a tool to help the SDGs not become back into being, si into being silos? So in, uh, in the SDG process, we proposed what we were calling the integrating approach, and the example that I like to give was infant and child mortality. And I used to point out that this target, which was always slotted under health, is not a health target. It also is a target about food security, on education, on gender, on economic growth, on inequality. And that unless all those sectors understood and appropriated as their own this target, we were never going to really break out of those silos. So the question there is how to effectively mainstream landscapes about both sectors and enablers, as you've proposed. I really would like to as throughout my presentation, please remember basically everything that Rachel Kite said in the preceding session, because this really builds upon that vision that she outlined, both in terms of the perspective of what the bank can offer and in terms of what the platform for engagement is. 
So let me say in this specific context that obviously the, the necessary starting point are the targets that specifically focus on forest or terrestrial ecosystems. Mm. And, but the, the key there is for us, the constituency here, to ensure that those outside of this room, outside of this forum, understand those terrestrial or those forest targets to be central to the development. We're still hearing, even three days ago, I was with a very high-ranking person from a developing country, and they were still you know, having that false dichotomy of development versus. So that is one of our first entry points and one of our first needs, and it sounds really obvious to all the converted sitting here, but it is an, a point that we have to make again and again. And that getting those line ministries, getting not just the, minister, the proverbial minister of finance, but I would like to say the proverbial minister of foreign affairs, because they're the guys that are negotiating over there, uh, to understand the role and responsibility in delivering these targets and why they're important is important, it's key. Uh, and there we need to really build together and work on concepts such as natural capital accounting and going beyond GDP. And here I'd just like to have a little advert. At the bank, I'm looking for partners who are working on these issues, so please come, please let's talk. We need to build together a coalition. We need to build together the evidence for that natural capital accounting. I also would like to say that in the negotiations, this division is very much there. Not a single head of delegation really knows in depth, and maybe I'm overstating, but not by much, red, LULUCF, or agriculture. There's the agriculture person in the delegation who deals with that issue, and the red specialist in each delegation, and they talk amongst themselves, <coughs> but the issues are never brought to a higher level. So that mainstreaming has to be both in UNFCCC and in post-2015 and in each government. So where do we need to also go from here beyond that obvious step, which seems obvious but is still necessary? And I would say that I really congratulate IAED on the paper they presented in the matrix, because I actually had gone through exactly that same exercise. I came up with about 57 targets that are either directly or indirectly very relevant to the uh, landscape's uh, agenda. And I would say that we need to do two things. We need to demonstrate the relevance, as I was saying, of the landscape's approach, but we, we also need to demonstrate why a landscape approach is fundamental to the full delivery, to the full implementation of these targets. Landscapes, in other words, should become a prism, both for the negotiations at UNFCCC and for the post-2015 agenda. That should be our goal. And let me speak here to two modalities for achieving that. The first one that I will mention is entry points. And I'm gonna give you, I could have picked others, but I'll talk about five very basic entry points that, where we need to make that case. The first has to do with economic models. There's a lot of targets that relate to things like sustaining per capita economic growth, or 8.2, on promoting a higher level of productivity of economies. But when we talk about economic growth, are, they really, are we really bringing to the fore the fact that growth needs energy and water and biomass? So we need to bring that into the negotiations. When we talk about the productivity of economies, what kind of economic model are we talking about? Is there a single economic model? What are those, how do we make sure that the uh, ecosystem services, the resources that underpin those economies are brought to the fore and are included, not just here, but for the longer term? How do we ensure that when people talk about jobs, and the big thing right now is to generate jobs, 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 that we're also talking not just about jobs, but perhaps about employment, about livelihoods, not just about creating jobs, which is usually uh, focus on an urban setting, but about maintaining and preserving jobs, which is more focused on livelihoods. We talk about in target 17.5 of investment promotion regimes for LDCs. Again, are those investment promotions looking, for example, at big agribusiness or mining, or are we starting to help and to identify how to manage the trade-offs and the competing land uses? Are we making sure that growth today does not sacrifice growth tomorrow? So that would be uh, one of the examples. Another very good example is governance. I would say that forest issues enable us to address broader governance issues related, for example, to uh, women's roles, to, gov to corruption, to access to information. Smallholders are both generators and users of information and very much tied to all the movement of big data. Legal identity, secure ownership, and what that means to how natural resources are managed. A third item would be private sector. There was a lot of discussion about that and very good points made by both Rachel and Peter, so I won't go there. But I'll say that, for example, that target on PPPs is not going, to, we need to make sure it doesn't just focus on PPPs for municipal sanitation infrastructure. Forests, 
fisheries, all these natural resource areas are essentially public-private partnerships. How do we get to understand that and to unpack this so that when we talk about PPPs in the context of post-2015, we are talking about natural resource management? How about to make sure that that includes the indigenous communities and other indigenous peoples and other communities who account for fully 30% of the forests in developing countries? Another key issue is stability and security. I would posit that natural resources are at the essence and at the core of maintaining social coherence and economic stability over the longer term. We've seen the food riots, questions around food security, but it's more, even more, it goes even more to the essence of that. Um, if you look at, for example, the point on uh, target 16.4 on illicit financial flows and organized crime, how do we make sure that the Rosewood crisis or elephant poaching is also a part of that conversation? That when we talk about that lost revenue, you're not only talking about lost revenue from the usual suspect sectors, but that natural resource management and not just the non-renewables are on the table and are being discussed. And finally, in terms of, of those um, five issues, I would also like uh, to point out that we also need to look at natural infrastructure, both natural infrastructures as a standalone but also blended natural uh, physical infrastructure that can result in bi bi big, bl uh, big savings in terms, for example, of hydropower and making sure that it's embedded really in the landscape approach so that you're, not, you're building dams and not stranded assets over the medium term. And I'd like you to just uh, to finalize this first point about the, the entry points, finish with a reference to the Inner Niger Delta. The Inner Niger Delta is basically a natural reservoir. It is a reservoir that happened to be built by Mother Nature. But right now, there's discussions about down, uh, further upstream dams that could really affect the flooding dynamics of that Inner Niger Delta. Because it's not understood to see as natural infrastructure, it's just something that's there. We're focusing is on how we can have lots of irrigation further upstream. Unless you balance those trade-offs, you risk losing what is a natural asset that is equivalent to a built reservoir and on which 40% of the livestock of Mali and of many of the other of the, of the Sahel region depends on during the dry months. We all know of the very difficult security situation in northern Mali, so I would posit that you, when you look at the Inner Niger Delta, it's not just natural infrastructure, it's a security asset. So we have to learn to look at assets in the, in the landscape in a very different way. And that's the kind of perspective and understanding we have to bring to the SDGs. It's not just mainstreaming in terms of seeing, you know, ticking off which targets are important for us. It's how we change how the very targets are understood in terms of landscapes. The second point I want to make, I'll be very short, is about indicators. During the uh, SDG process, we, pro we posited the idea of a dashboard in order to deal with the differentiation because you need to deal with the different realities of countries along the development spectrum. But what I'm positing now is that we need to think about the same thing at the subnational level because we're all talking about implementation. Implementation at the subnational level faces very different challenges in very different contexts, particularly for very large countries perhaps like in Indonesia of the world, but also in a country like Colombia and sometimes in even smaller land masses, you have a great deal of complexity and changes. So how can we really start to unpack this at the level of subnational indicators so that this SDG agenda becomes relevant to um, to, the, to, to those who are going to be doing the, the implementation. So those, I think, are two basic key entry points to answer to the questions that I've been asked. I would just fin finish by saying that metrics should really spur economies, our economies, our societies, to find solutions that, don't, that stop seeing climate resilient and smart development as a zero-sum game, which is still how very much see it. It should incentivize two things, greater coherence on RED, LULUCF, and agriculture under UNFCCC, and it should position landscapes as the organizing function, or one of the organizing functions, if you will, of the post-15 uh, post uh, process. From the bank group, I can say that we're ready and willing to leverage our technical and operational expertise on the ground, our global knowledge, and our financial support. We see a very promising uh, atmosphere out there. Countries and partners are lining up. We see financing coming in. GCF is starting to be capitalized. We see commitments on the forest investment program and other funds. The New York Declaration attests to a growing commitment, not just on governments, but more importantly, private sector. And with this, we can now go to scale in the timeframes that are necessary. But let us not remember, forget that, and I don't want to be negative here, that we're really starting, we're looking at a two or a three degree world. 
We're looking at changing consumption patterns in an emerging global middle class that has needs and expectations that will not really be, that don't easily fit into planetary resources. So, and we have demographics, we have a really accelerating competition for land and resources. So the time frames and the scale are really of the essence. I hope that we are able to galvanize the action that's needed, because in my darker moments, I do sometimes wonder if the S and sustainability doesn't stand for survival. I think there's more hope than that, but we should really bear that in mind. So I look forward to working with you. And for me, the fact that there's a forum, that there's so many people at this forum, is a ground for hope and a grounds for thinking that we can turn things around as fast as they need to be working together. So thank you, and thank you again. Thank you, Paula. We'll go straight on. Thank you, Camilla. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm delighted to be sharing a panel with so many distinguished colleagues. I think that Paula set the scene very well for us in terms of the urgency and the scale of the challenge. For us, we found the design and negotiation of the SDGs as a wonderful global learning process, really, for all involved. The broad range of interests and actors feeding into the process have made very evident, have, have been made very evident by the large number of goals and targets which have come forth. Some people say we should really go for a much smaller number of targets, but it seems to me that the high complexity of the real world in which we live really gives good grounds for us living with the 17 goals that have come from the Open Working Group process. As Simon mentioned, my own background is in the drylands, and I was very glad that Paula raised the particular problem of the Inner Niger Delta in Mali, which is an example of a fantastic bit of natural infrastructure which is now very much threatened by a series of big dams. But dry land areas are essentially a series of landscapes of farmland and grazing within which scattered trees have got huge value acting as windbreaks to stem erosion, offering fodder, shade to livestock who manure the land. They're a source of fruit leaves for sauce, wood for fuel, and they also serve as a giant nutrient pump, drawing up through their roots nutrients deep in the soil for use at the surface. And what's invisible below ground, the rooting system, is as important as what you see above ground. And in like fashion, the enabling conditions that support better forest management, rights, institutions, values, regulations, while invisible, are hugely important to getting local benefits from trees and woodland. So trees, for me, are very much <coughs> emblematic of sustainable development. They span past and future generations. They generate multiple benefits. They contribute to both public and private goods, and they need care, investment, and nurturing if they are to deliver on promise. So forest landscapes need to find a central place in the SDG process, goals, and targets. It's important that forests be highly visible both in one goal and also integrated across the full set of SDGs and their targets. And we've seen the Open Working Group generate much positive progress for forests. There's strong mention of forests within Goal 15, inclusion of restoration and afforestation within Target 15.2, a focus on incentives and financing within 15. B. Sustainable management of water within Goal 6 includes restoration of forest land within Target 
and local community participation in 6B, reflecting the need for integrated water resource management within local landscapes. Equal control is included alongside rights, access and ownership of land in targets 1.4 and 5A, and indigenous peoples get explicit recognition within targets 2.3 and 4.5. So a lot of progress made, but always some gaps, some key, is key issues missing, and some room for greater clarity on targets. For me, one missing element relates to recognizing the very uneven power exerted by different interests. So for example, forest and farm producer organizations urgently need strengthening so that they can better voice and represent their interests. Collective action as forest producers and marketers makes a big difference for forest SMEs and really helps them gain a stronger voice and acquire market power. Another missing issue is integrated and inclusive land use planning, which has to be at the heart of local landscape management and how trees fit within this. Both these issues, strengthening of producer organizations and integrated inclusive land use planning, have been raised among the top priorities for forests by stakeholder consultation and the workshop here in Lima last month. We also see the need for strong commitment to tackle drivers of deforestation, building on the New York De Declaration on Forests during Climate Week last September. If the SDGs are to be transformatory, we must tackle also the systemic barriers to building a better enabling environment which have to do with power and whose voice counts. First, as Rachel was reminding us in the previous session, it means a firm commitment to social justice and good governance, especially to the rule of law and access to justice. It means recognizing local rights to control, own, and access land and forests. Second, better market access requires support for small and medium-sized enterprise, their produce organizations, intermediary services, and also means to hold the private sector to account. Third, further work is needed on metrics, such as finding ways to track and report changes in land and forest management plus simple, clear measures for valuing forest ecosystem services. And I can certainly point you to a whole number of groups, including ourselves, working on natural capital accounts. Turning finally to implementation, the energy generated by the SDG process has meant there are high aspirations for what this process might achieve. But implementation runs up against many challenges, particularly the highly diverse context in which people and trees actually live, the limited capacity to put policy into practice, and the power dynamics, which mean that poor people find it difficult to get their rights respected and their interests represented. IIED's work with partners clearly shows this diversity of context between different regions. LDC perspectives are particularly important to understand because of often high dependence on forests and natural resources for livelihoods, as well as state revenue and export earnings. A module approach can be useful to try and build on these local nuances and identify opportunities for policy coherence and possible trade-offs. And we have a paper on this available on IID's website if you want to go in more detail on that. 
For us at IID, we've done a lot of work on environmental mainstreaming, which tries to break down false boundaries which we've erected between disciplines and administrative functions. But for us, the integration of different elements seems to be much easier the closer to the ground you go. At global level, we seem to engage in a lot of arcane debate on how the different goals relate to each other. But it becomes much more tangible once you're down to local, municipality, or landscape level. So I see a landscape approach as offering the ideal framework for delivering many of the SDGs. So my final plea is let's try and avoid over-engineering the SDGs from top down by trying to nail down all the detail. Let's rather try and devolve power and decision-making to local landscape level through recognizing rights to own, control, and access land and forests. From this, you can then build a bottom-up learning process that anchors the SDGs in those who can benefit most from their delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. His Excellency, Herod, please. Thank you, Simon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a pleasure for me this afternoon to speak to you. Indonesia is a maybe very unique country in the sense of when we start talking about Red Plus, my president was also asked by the Secretary General to be <coughs> the co-chair of the high-level panel for post-2015 development agenda. So while I was the secretary of the task force to create the strategy as well as the institution to do the reduction of emission from deforestation and forest degradation, I was also the secretary for the committee that was set up to support the president for the post-2015 development agenda. So I get a little bit confused. Which is which? Okay, talking about SDGs, talking about post 2000 development agenda, or talking about forest and landscape. So my comment here, ladies and gentlemen, may not be too structured, but my understanding while trying to understand the two streams at the same time is that if we define reduction of emission from deforestation and forest degradation <clears throat> in its complete terms, it's, called, it's talking about developing countries, right? REDD in developing countries, which means that inherently REDD is a development program. Because if it's not development program, that is not getting into the developing country. Why should it only be in the developing country? Now, having said that, looking through and walking through the process of getting into the post-2015 development agenda and looking into the result of the high-level panel and comparing that with the result of the not done yet open working group, you will see that there are some progress and there are some problems. And the way I see it is that RDD is actually the convergence of the issue of development, which is very much triggered, which is very much influenced by the SDGs, and climate change. And forest and landscape, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, is the living theater of the convergence of these two issues. Now, when you're talking about the living theater of that, it means that those issues of climate change and the SDGs needs to be seen and interacting within that landscape. So how do you relate these two? When we are talking about the SDGs and when I was in that process, I noticed several things. The first one 
is that this is actually a continuum, a movement from MDG into the SDG. Don't miss that. If you are talking about this is a disruption thing, totally different, then we miss a lot of our lessons learned, including how to score goals. Because we are talking about scoring goals, right? How to score goals in MDGs? Are we achieving the goals of MDGs? Are we measuring it right? Is the goalpost there clear and everybody is hitting the same time in the same directions? Or is it something that is unclear? When you say half the poverty and we achieve that target, it achieve that goal, but that is because of China is doing very well and the Sub-Saharan Africa is still not doing that well. So is that achieving a goal? Is that scoring a goal? There's a question mark. Will we repeat that problem when we are getting into the SDG? Are we scoring the right goals? Are we having the right statistics? Are we having the right methodology and also governance system to make that goal real? Achieving of that goal, something that is actually achieving what was the objective of that. That's number one. Number two, what I learned there is that this movement is talking about poverty in a very different way. You're talking about a multiple dimension property. Multi-dimensional poverty is not only income poverty. And because of that, when you try to achieve that eradication of poverty as in the SDG, think again, what is it that you're talking about? Income poverty, health access poverty, education access poverty, livelihood poverty, happiness poverty, happiness poverty? Ah, you can do it on a very long list of what is this multi-dimensional poverty. So achieving the goal on that poverty line is something that is going to be another complexity in calculation. The third thing that was emphasized during this open working group and before is about the global partnership. The MDG number eight was never really be successful, right? So we are talking about that. The global partnership is very important to achieve here. Now, if you're talking about SDG, forest and landscape, is global partnership in play when you're talking about making that forest and landscape really produce? Is the number, is the amount of forest in Indonesia good for the world or is it good for Indonesia? Or is it different? Or is it the same? Then you're talking about how global partnership define what needs to be done moving forward. The, third, the other thing that is coming out from that is the means of implementation. Means of implementation on the MDG was not very strong. Now the means of implementation for SDG needs to be triple, quadruple in terms of strength, which means governance is very important, which means that the ability, the system, and the budget of countries needs to be directed toward the right directions. From that, when you're talking about forest and you're talking about landscapes, at the end of the day, if poverty eradication is the objective, is the right of the people part of the poverty? If the people is having a poverty because their right is not acknowledged, now we need to also address the forest dwelling people's right for land, right for livelihood, right for health, right for everything else. And so you're talking about what will be the benefit that we are getting or we are achieving, we are trying to achieve when we have the sustainable development goals matching with the, the problem of the climate change into the landscape and the forest as the living theater. I will say I don't agree with the statement of a co-benefit. Co-benefit is a parallel benefit. I will make use of the terms interdependent benefit because the benefit on one end will be affecting the other benefit on the other end. So you can have a series of benefits. If you have this benefit, better that this benefit create another benefit at the same time. If in the beginning you're talking about interdependent benefits, I will ask later on that it should be an inter-supportant benefits. This benefit supported other benefit, not just parallel, not just joint, but it is actually a living connections of benefits. And the last one that I will say here, I think the open working group is not done. The SDG is not done yet. When we are doing something on only by intergovernment process, it's only half of the process. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proposing for intercommunity 
processes where government is just one community. If you have the government as one community, the scientists another community, the, the community community is another community, or they, and the private sector is another community, and if everyone is thinking as the inter-community process, then we will have the, red, the real sustainable development goals, the real climate change addressing actions, and at the same time also knowing that the living theater is not only going to be a theater for the show of climate change versus sustainable development, but it is actually the theater that is alive and its life is getting better because of the combination of the two. It's an issue that us, the human species, needs to address in a way that is not very just sectoral, government as a sector, scientists as a sector, or the private sector as a sector. It has to be inter-community. Ladies and gentlemen, goal scoring is not easy. MDG experiences shows that we are not that good. We may be a lot of tic-tacking, the playing tiki-taka, very good on that. But when you're talking about goal scoring, we want to match Ronaldo and Messi. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Bahera. Very lively uh, presentation. Peter, please, thanks. Thank you. I think one, one of the first questions you had for this session was how has Forrest approached integrated solutions? And I thought hard about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought even harder about it. I couldn't really find out any, any good examples, but it's obvious that we need to formulate that. So let me, let me first say that about a year ago, I was deeply engaged in a debate between the forestry institutions. And, and the debate was whether, how, not whether, how can we make one of the goals to be about forests? I was a traitor because I said, I don't think we should have a goal on forests. I think that would be bad because it, it would only lead to the same situation as we had with the MDGs, where forest was tucked in under environment and the only measure was the area of the forest, and that's it. Instead, I've argued that we must take this opportunity to redefine forestry to contribute across the sustainable development goals. And I think we're getting closer to that, particularly if we think about the landscapes approach. But there is a lot of, shall we say, traditional thinking Many forestry institutions are still arguing for a specific forest agenda, specific uh, forest targets, etc. I think we need to think hard about how can we integrate the forest agenda into the broader development agenda. It is beginning to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. I think the IIED work in this, in this field has been extremely useful, and uh, I encourage you all to, to read their findings. Um, I want to focus uh, this very brief talk on indicators um, because <coughs> the discussion is now leading towards how can we measure progress without ending up in the hundreds of obscure indicators that we've seen in so many different uh, development efforts. And, and we, so we really need some smart indicators that can help us forward. Um, if you think about it, there is only really one indicator out there that is commonly used and e understood by mm. everyone. It's GDP, money. Um, and one of the preparation questions from Simon before the session was to, that if, if anyone disagreed with the previous speaker, you should say so. And I, I said I would be lost. And, but, but what I want, I don't want to disagree, but I want to compliment something that Paula said. Because, Paula, you put a lot of emphasis on natural resources accounting. This is an extremely important way to go. It's, it, it's really, at the national accounting level, absolutely important that we internalize the natural resources in, in the economic decisions. But let's not think that this is something we can apply everywhere and in all situations, because it's a very complicated process. And it's not always that it is practical or even ethical to bring everything into a GDP plus uh, uh, calculation. For landscapes at the local level, we will probably always have to consider several dimensions of values. 
uh, the econo economics is of course a big part of it, but it's not all of it. So that's not a disagreement, it's more a compliment, compliment to, to what you said. Um, now, indicators. Um, now we've dis discussed the landscape approach. One of the key factors we've seen is that, and as some have said already, this could be a bridge, an interface to the SDGs, a way to an analytical framework to move towards the SDG ambition. Uh, but in doing that, we need a small set of measurables that tells us whether we're going in the right direction or not. And this is not so trivial because we want to be able to study progress at a very local level. And we also want to be able to study progress at a national level. And preferably, these should be connected somehow. We also want to have a reasonably standardized approach so that, like GDP, GDP is more or less the same everywhere. It is the same everywhere, but it means different things. But then we have this diversity of landscapes. It's impossible to define exactly what's that something that is good in one landscape is also good in a different <laughs> landscape. So where, how can we shape the, these smart indicators so that we really move forward? And we've, we've been suggesting four indicators, actually. If I'm still challenging everyone I see to, to say whether it's good enough or if, if we need to think harder. Four measures. And these measures are all scalable. They can be widely understood and appreciated. I can explain it to, to, to my teenagers or I can explain it to a politician. It has to work. Um, they can be monitored at reasonable cost. And very important, something we'll come back to, it, it can work for the finance community. So four measures. One is improved livelihoods, and it's pretty much about income. It's not only about income, but income is a pretty good proxy for, for improved livelihoods. Two, sustained ecosystem services. You can define ecosystem services in different ways. But I, I propose that biomass content per hectare in the landscape is a pretty good proxy. Yes, it doesn't exactly measure biodiversity. Yes, it doesn't exactly measure water uh, conditions. It doesn't exactly measure the productivity of the soils. But as a proxy, it's pretty good. Three, resource efficiency. And that's more straightforward. It has to do a lot with how much energy we use for producing things from the land. Resource efficiency, well, it's greenhouse gas emissions per produced unit. And four, and this is the one that we are often concerned with, the delivery of food and non-food products. We need to make sure that we have the right, the right supply levels. Four measures. Everybody can see that they are relevant. Uh, possibly we can agree that they are encompassing, and maybe we can agree that they can be measured in, in the ways I propose. This does not say that these are the SDG indicators, but this could be a framework, an analytical framework to start with when we go towards the landscape approach. We could, for example, say that if all of these four in indicators are stable or improving, then we're good. And that brings me to my final point. If we want, as I said in here earlier, if we want to uh, enthuse the, the finance, the large-scale finance community uh, to start investing in sustainable land use, to provide access to capital for smallholders that is affordable <laughs> and long-term and, and, uh, and uh, fair, um, then those fund managers need to have something to hold on to, something that is more tangible than a political decision on uh, uh, carbon credits or whatever. And that tangible measure could be uh, proof of moving in the sustainability direction through four indicators like this. That can be applied geographically anywhere. And that's important too, because if we're talking about large scale large-scale finance engagement, then we, we cannot talk about one country at a time, or one crop at a time, or one, one, final, sorry, one climate zone at a time. We need to talk globally. And then we need to find out indicators that can measure progress across all these situations and still be standardized so that the finance people can you know, use them in, in their models and in their, in their uh, 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 analysis on, on both profitable and sustainable investments. Now I've talked a lot about that, and I would like to finish by saying that 
forests and SDGs is in reality the same as landscapes and SDGs. We don't have to make a very big distinction between the two. But I'm very happy that we have a session with a focus on forests because um, we are, after all, a forestry organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. For indicators, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And lastly, can I ask Maria to <laughs> come up? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Muy buenas tardes con todos y todas. Eh, para mí es un, un reto, en realidad, eh, después de haber tenido estas brillantes intervenciones, eh, poder a, aportar con, con las notas que, que he preparado. Pero básicamente eh, la participación nuestra tiene que ver con contarles a todos ustedes que nuestro país alojó una importante reunión el 17 y 18 de noviembre pasado, eh, sobre este tema, sobre el enfoque eh, o una aproximación integral eh, de la temática de bosques relacionada a todo el proceso de elaboración de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y cómo iba a estar presente el tema en la agenda post-2015. Eh, me voy a permitir relatarles brevemente que durante el 17 y 18 eh, contamos con representantes eh, de todas las regiones del mundo aquí en Perú, en Lima, eh, expertos, muchos eh, investigadores, representantes de gobiernos, también de la sociedad civil que nos reunimos, para realizar precisamente este taller eh, dedicado al tema de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y cómo el tema de bosques debería eh, incorporarse eh, de manera ya no solamente focal en, en algún objetivo en específico, sino de, de manera eh, transversal. Yo creo que el, el objetivo del taller se cumplió. Nosotros nos encontramos elaborando un documento, síntesis, con los principales aportes del desarrollo de esta metodología de, de enfoque o aproximación eh, transversal que esperamos terminar antes de, de finalizar el mes de febrero con las revisiones y los aportes de, de los participantes. Pero principalmente eh, de los resultados eh, de este trabajo podemos eh, compartir que se definieron cuatro importantes temas para, eh, para abordar la temática de bosques en relación a los ODS. Uno de, el primero de ellos está referido a la mitigación del cambio climático, la resiliencia y la adaptación. El otro tiene que ver con oportunidades de empleo relacionado a la gestión de los bosques, el acceso al agua y a la energía también en relación a estos importantes ecosistemas y también a la protección de la diversidad biológica. Y definimos luego de aplicar esta metodología de, del enfoque transversal, eh, de esta aproximación más integral y modular, algunos eh, temas eh, sobre la base de los cuales debemos eh, implementar las metas. Y, y una, uno de ellos tenía que ver con las bases políticas de ese proceso, el tema de la gobernanza basado... El, el tema de la gobernanza basada en el respeto a la ley, la transparencia y el acceso a la información, el acceso a la participación en la toma de decisiones de la, de la gestión de estos ecosistemas y por ende eh, lograr la, eh, la tan ansiada justicia ambiental. También eh, la necesidad de definir metas respecto a garantizar los derechos a la tierra y a los recursos naturales, y a la distribución justa de los beneficios y la utilización de estos recursos. Paula mencionaba que, que en, esta, en esta base más normativa y política se deberían abordar, y coincidimos con ello, temas tan delicados como delitos ambientales, eh, cómo se aborda el, el tema de género, el tema de la corrupción, el tema de garantizar derechos eh, de transparencia y acceso a la información. Esto estuvo presente también eh, eh, en la definición de, de estas fases políticas. Luego eh, definimos en grupo que era importante eh, relacionar el tema de mecanismos, el tema a mecanismos de mercado justo y responsable, 
el acceso a mercados y promoción de la diversificación eh, del proceso productivo necesi necesita contar con metas específicas, el apoyo a pequeña empresa y organización de productores también, las prácticas sustentables y responsables por parte del sector privado, un fuerte componente de la discusión se basó precisamente en, en, la, en el relacionamiento del manejo del bosque y las empresas privadas, la promoción del empleo y la formación de empresas también, o pequeñas empresas, la articulación de, de los grandes extractores de, del bosque con eh, los pequeños, eh, las pequeñas organizaciones eh, también de productores. Luego abordamos el, cómo este enfoque de paisaje, un manejo efectivo eh, de los recursos naturales, eh, se tenía, era necesario para, para relacionar, al, eh, relacionar el bosque y a los ODS, eh, definimos que el manejo sostenible de bosques y de recursos naturales debería tener también una, eh, unas metas, que los sistemas agrícolas y de producción alimentaria sostenible también de la misma forma eh, eh, considerar la gestión integrada de los recursos hídricos, y luego el uso de los suelos, eh, este manejo integral de suelos que también debería ser eh, implementado. La generación de eh, metodologías y mecanismos de implementación, también una vez que, que se, defina, eh, se definan las metas, se hablaron de incentivos, del desarrollo de la investigación, de la ciencia y de la transferencia tecnológica. El tema de fortalecimiento de capacidades eh, institucionales y precisamente esta sinergia y coordinaciones entre las agencias y organismos de cooperación eh, internacional con lo, las organizaciones estatales y también la valoración de servicios ecosistémicos. Creo que después de haber escuchado estas importantes intervenciones me atrevería a decir que, que durante toda la discusión del, del taller estuvo muy presente el tema eh, que resaltaba Paula sobre la infraestructura, cómo, cómo es que eh, todos estos temas si requieren de, de, una, de un fuerte desarrollo, una fuerte inversión de los países en eh, promoción y, y, e implementación de energías alternativas eh, y la utilización de estos denominados activos, activos naturales, ¿no? en el caso de nuestro país, como eh, el planificar eh, la obtención de energía eh, en base a la energía hidroeléctrica es, es fundamental también. Todos estos elementos que he compartido con ustedes sin duda son esenciales y precisamente hacen notar que el rol de los bosques en la definición de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible pues, es fundamental. Lo que también nos dimos cuenta en el trabajo fue eh, la relación de la temática de bosques eh, muy estrecha con el objetivo 15 eh, de la lista de estos 17 que, que el grupo eh, abierto eh, a, nos, ha, nos ha entregado, está, que está referido a los ecosistemas terrestres y también los múltiples vínculos de los bosques eh, alrededor de los 17 objetivos definidos. Y sobre estos vínculos, eh, todas, estas, eh, ac, ac, todas estas condiciones habilitantes precisamente para, eh, para tener eh, no solamente indicadores, sino las, eh, los objetivos implementándose en el terreno es que les puedo comentar que nuestro país eh, ya tiene un compromiso muy alto y se definió una meta muy grande eh, respecto al tema de deforestación hacia el 2021. Eh, aseguramos eh, tener una, una deforestación cero hasta a, hacia ese año del bosque primario y solo lo vamos a lograr definitivamente abordando eh, las denominadas externalidades. En el caso de nuestro país, las externalidades críticas, tienen, eh, críticas de la deforestación tienen que ver con el combate a la minería ilegal y también con una expansión, expansión agrícola no planificada. Recordemos que, que el Perú es un territorio realmente retador. ¿no? Tenemos el territorio ciertamente vasto, pero también muy diverso, que va desde estas zonas áridas que, que también nos han compartido aquí, cuál es la vulnerabilidad eh, pasando por montañas y, y luego el llano amazónico, ¿no? eh, que es un reto sin duda para eh, gestionar eh, con este también enfoque del paisaje. ¿no? Eh, finalmente puedo compartirles que, que ya Perú tiene algunos avances, que, es, que sabe que, 
que, que tienen que dar señales claras eh, en, esta, eh, en esta etapa donde somos anfitriones de esta tan importante conferencia mundial y que ha logrado un fortalecimiento institucional muy importante con la creación del Servicio Nacional Forestal, CERFOR, y también con una propuesta de Estrategia Nacional sobre Bosques y Cambio Climático, que en este momento se encuentra a través de un comité nacional procurando eh, que esas propuestas sean consensuadas eh, con todos los actores, con la, la mayor cantidad de actores que se pueda, que se involucren en, en su aprobación. También contamos con sistemas nacionales de información que ya incluyen eh, plataformas de red para, eh, para apoyar eh, su implementación concreta y con la reciente ley de servicios ecosistémicos. Todos estos instrumentos eh, estrechamente relacionados eh, tienen toda una complejidad, pero sí nos permiten decir que eh, estaríamos encaminando eh, la, el cuidado de la biodiversidad, estaríamos encaminando también mecanismos de financiamiento eh, orientados al desarrollo sostenible y que la gestión apropiada de los bosques pues, tenga eh, un aporte muy concreto a, a, a este desarrollo sostenible tan ansiado. Después de, de culminado el, el, el proceso de, de consulta, esperamos que este documento sin duda aporte eh, a la discusión que, como bien dijeron eh, quienes me antecedieron, eh, todavía es un proceso abierto. Todavía eh, nos falta dar eh, algunos pasos por delante. Eh, pero creo que, que para nuestro país eh, lo más importante es que ya pasar a la implementación o a la definición de, de, de metas eh, tiene que hacerse en consecuencia con eh, los principales elementos con los que ya contamos. Eh, yo he visto aquí en el panel una complementariedad muy buena desde un enfoque de política, desde un enfoque económico y desde un enfoque ecosistémico, que sin duda eh, nos tiene que hacer recordar eh, que no porque produzcamos más planes y programas vamos a estar en sí abordando una temática, sino eh, que, que lo que va a tener éxito es que eh, nosotros, siendo conscientes de todos los instrumentos que tengamos, podamos ir eh, al momento de la implementación a la escala local de manera ordenada y que podamos canalizar recursos de esa manera ordenada. En nuestro país han proliferado una, un sinnúmero de procedimientos, protocolos, estrategias, eh, planes, pero que ya eh, este proceso de, de construcción de objetivos más globales nos van a permitir encaminar todas aquellas iniciativas para una implementación muy, mucho más concreta en el terreno. El compromiso de, del Perú está, eh, está ahí. Eh, y agradecemos más bien que nos hayan permitido alojar esta importante reunión y que producto de esa discusión que fue de, de varias regiones del mundo podamos aportar y, y ratificar la importancia del tema, de la temática de bosques en, en este proceso de construcción de objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y sobre todo de esta agenda post-2015. Gracias. Thank you, Sonia, and apologies for not calling you by your right name at the beginning. Um, very good. So those are very rich presentations, and uh, I think. I'd also like to use the opportunity to thank the Peruvian government for hosting the event two weeks ago, which was a, a very s successful event in many regards to taking on this, concept, con this concept of an integrated look um, at, at bringing in forests into the SDGs. And uh, so thank you to Peru for that. Now let's, let's go to some our guiding questions. Um, we have limited time left, so can I have the slides, please? We're going to start with uh, the first question, um, which is, which will come up in a moment, I'm sure, which is about, so we have, we've heard from the panelists that there have been um, some quite positive progress made by the Open Working Group. Where am I supposed to press this thing? Is it behind me or that? There we go. Thank you. So, 
we've, we've heard about some, some of the positive progress that's been made in terms of uh, incorporating forests. Some differences in opinion as to whether forests should be featured explicitly or whether it's the other integrated aspects that are necessary from the landscape um, perspective. There's been some positive progress. But what else is now needed up until September? Uh, this is what I'd like us to focus on. We're in a critical period where I suppose one could say one, if, if perhaps if we were to lie low, having seen these positive achievements, um, could forest then uh, forests and forest landscapes disappear off the agenda? Um, I suppose red is not a particularly prominent item this COP as it was in the past. Could it possibly uh, lose a bit of focus? So, what kind of what kind of uh, action is now needed? Um, so, I'd like to throw this out to the audience. To start with, please. Uh, if anyone has views to share, thank you. Ayesha, I think is that great. Yes. Um, so I'm Mia Crawford from the Swedish Ministry for Rural Affairs. And I'm actually here in Lima to negotiate land use issues, including red, even though it, we, have had, we haven't had much of a success in that issue. But I also have a, a hand in the discussion on the SDGs from the Swedish side. Um, and I also want to take on the opportunity to challenge uh, some of the panelists, since this was also a quest from the beginning. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, both C4 and IIED for all of your work over the last year. I think a lot of the papers that you have produced on the SDGs and the, the whole notion of the landscape ideas um, is really trickling in into these SDG <coughs> negotiations. And I'm not sure if you have seen the SD, SGs um, synthesis report. It was launched two days ago. And uh, paragraph 74 puts landscape in the center. So, and um, I don't know, have you, are you all familiar with this paragraph? Otherwise I could read out some of the um, extract from it. Well, it's under prosperity to grow a strong, inclusive and transformative economy. And there it reads that sustainable approaches to landscape management including agriculture and forestry, industrialization, access to energy and water and sanitation are key drivers of sustainable production and consumption, job creation, as well as sustainable and equitable growth. Long sentence. <laughs> they deliver sustainable management of natural resources and tackle climate change. So I think this is a very good uh, foundation to build on. So leaning on to what is now needed is really to make sure that this kind of language stays on in the further process. But um, so I do want to challenge you a little bit there um, that we do see the linkages from the climate negotiations, the SDGs, at least some of us who are involved in, in these processes. Um, what else is needed? I really think the, there's a lot of work needing on the indicators, so I'd like to really thank Peter for bringing that up. However, I do see that a lot of the indicators that you mentioned are perhaps more what I would see as uh, sub-targets uh, under that kind of goal that I just uh, read out. Um, so, one other message from me to take on and maybe for you to respond is um, it would be good to see in there gender equality and then more of the land rights and long-term um, forest tenure issues and um, another message would be that we need to also think and build on existing data and indicators not to reinvent the wheel thank you Thank you very much. Would anybody like to add on, Philip, please? Yeah. Other panel members, please feel free to 
chip in. Can we have all the microphones on, please, at the front? Thanks. If I can just yeah, come in very quickly on that. I think on the issue of metrics, you have to ask yourself, who are the rail land users? Who are the decision makers in relation to that land? And you need to map metrics and tools that give those land users the capacity to measure, monitor, act in relation to what these metrics are telling them. So for me, if rights and control are being vested in local land users, you need to build on how they look at how they manage, how they monitor changes in the status of that land, and see that as being the, the real focus, if you like, for investment. It's useful to have some higher level metrics that government can aggregate, compare with other parts of the country, compare with other mm -hmm. countries, but actually what you need are practical tools for the real land users. They're not with all due respect, people in ministries in the capital city, they're the people on the ground. And therefore, I mean, what we've found useful in some of the work that we've been doing in northern Kenya is seeing how you can marry local people's knowledge and understanding of patterns of land use and change with um, satellite images that they become actually extremely adept at using <coughs> how you can combine that local knowledge with um, certain satellite imagery in a way that gives those local people greater capacity to understand and act on the resources in their locality. May I add on that? <coughs> I think this is very interesting. When you're talking about, uh, I agree with you in terms of the land user needs to have the right metrics for that. But the spectrum of complexity is very wide. Mm -hmm. Like the case in Indonesia, the right of the, uh, what you call the cultural people, the indigenous people. In the past, the group is not acknowledged by the government because it's being informal. So it has to be formalized first, understood, and then the boundary of the right of the land be established, the tenurial rights needs to be put in place in the, first, in the first place, and then they will be asked to do that measurement of how the land is being used. On the other extreme, there are companies that have 3 million hectares of land mm. as a license to that. How they use that land and how they can measure that in terms of getting into the sustainable use is a different kind again. In the middle, you have the forest management unit of the government that will need to address as well in a different way. So I think when we are talking about sustainable development goals, the universal goals and local target needs to be put in place such that the metrics is actually appropriate but can be aggregated into something that is universally moving towards sustainability. So the how to do that is the complex thing. And I think even that should be a goal, that the government and organizations needs to develop the mechanism and the measurement mm -hmm. that will make the achievement of the goal possible. Without that, I think it will be very difficult. Statistic is still very weak. Okay. Uh, well, in reality, eh, provocadora la, la, la participación de eh, perdón, tu, la intervención tuya respecto a, a cómo repensar eh, eh, el hecho de establecer ya eh, o tomar algunos indicadores o estrategias eh, que ya venimos eh, implementando en nuestros países y de los cuales los gobiernos tenemos responsabilidad de dar cuenta y monitorear Solamente en las convenciones de Río, cuando los países hacemos estos denominados informes nacionales, tenemos ya eh, que hacer estos reportes con indicadores y metas claras de acuerdo incluso a la, a cada, a la metodología de cada convención. 
esto se complica a nivel de una gestión de, de un gobierno, imaginémonos cómo esto se va a complicar a una escala más, eh, más local. ¿no? Pero también hay otras consideraciones, ¿no? lo, lo comentábamos que hay consideraciones culturales, eh, nuestro país por ejemplo es un país multicultural, para, ahí, para enfocar un tema como la gestión del bosque es un diálogo incluso entre culturas, entre la cultura occidental, ¿no? que, que, que tenemos principalmente en, la, eh, en las ciudades, y, y cómo hace el diálogo con limitaciones de lenguaje o de comunicación eh, se tiene que llevar a cabo para gestionar el territorio. La conflictividad socioambiental está cada vez creciendo respecto precisamente a cómo nos ponemos de acuerdo en el manejo de recursos. Es muy complicado, eh, nosotros confiamos en que debe haber un enfoque de arriba hacia abajo, pero también de abajo hacia arriba, pero una interfaz de diálogo. Y esta interfaz de diálogo, eh, creo que el proceso de construcción y elaboración de, de, de objetivos de desarrollo sostenible es la mejor oportunidad. Nuestro país tiene en este momento una comisión nacional de, de multisectores que están llevando el diálogo de, lo, de la construcción de ODS a, otras, a otros lugares, incluso no solamente se discute en Lima, sino se discute en otras regiones, porque tenemos instancias o autoridades subnacionales que también tienen que intervenir y actores locales también. ¿no? Entonces, eh, yo creo que hay elementos, no solamente con un enfoque ambiental o un enfoque muy económico, sino de unas consideraciones hasta antropológicas y sociológicas que tenemos que incorporar. No, eh, no solamente es dar cuenta a la Convención Marco de Cambio Climático, sino también dar cuenta eh, internamente en el país. ¿no? Lo importante de todos estos procesos, y creo que muchos coincidirán conmigo, es que se han puesto en la mesa, están ya en la agenda. Para nuestro país hacer una reunión tan importante como esta ha significado que nuestros más importantes tomadores de decisión le den una mirada también a cuán importante es la gestión de recursos naturales y a Latinoamérica también. Entonces, eh, sí es importante que, que, que contribuyamos a, a este diálogo y, y necesitamos muchas más herramientas para, para precisamente eh, definir eh, de qué manera vamos a monitorear eh, esta gestión ¿no? tan compleja de todo. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, there's a few more hands. Uh, we we have to um, agree that maybe we have to, maybe we're just going to focus on this and probably just one other question in the time available. Um, before we go to another question, I just want to emphasize: let's try and stick to this question. We're thinking about so what do negotiators need to think about, particularly in this period in the run-up. And I think some of the discussion now was it probably edging on what happens thereafter at local levels in terms of interpretation, but there are also considerations on indicators which may have to happen in the, uh, up to September 2015. I wanted to just pose one, one quick question, and um, then over to you, Peter. Uh, I heard through the various presentations, I think two of them mentioned the importance of land use planning as one of the kind of fundamental not fundamental constructs, but one of the important ingredients. Uh, the, the importance of inclusive, integrated, I think, was mentioned. But land use planning is one of the kind of key tools. And yet this is one thing that's totally absent from the SDG framework as it stands. There are other issues as well. I'm sure others can also pick out other issues that are missing. How does one deal with these missing issues? Um, and how, how do you deal with them without opening up the entire SDG framework as it's now opposed to totally unpacking and destroying maybe some of the good work that's already been done. How does one achieve this? Well, and then over, I'll, then over to I'll, I'll just say very quickly that I, from where I'm sitting now, I have, all I can say is that it is an intergovernmental process and, and the bank doesn't have a view about where that process is going. But the sense is that what came out of June as I said before, is pretty good. It's good enough to go. Uh, and if we keep trying to open and tinker it and try to make it a little bit better and a little bit more perfect, the perfect becomes the enemy of the good. I think the focus has to be on implementation. And some of the questions that were coming up are at two levels. At one level is how do we already get 
geared up for implementation. And, and in that sense, the bank is ready to go to hit the ground to, to support countries in whatever they want to do now to start to unpack these targets, to start to, to work on that. Mm -hmm. A separate issue, which is very much <coughs> linked to that, and I think speaks to the, the feedback between that conversation that we were just having about indicators, is how, as we actually hit the ground running and start to work on implementation, what comes out of that in terms of how that can inform the negotiation process. The next step is definitely going to be looking at indicators. I hope that it will not be a fully a, a process as was done for the targets, because my hope is that the we could actually end up with, that there won't be a correlation between the number of targets and the number of indicators. We could end up with a lot less indicators if the indicators are really smart and if the indicators are really integrative. So I think that that would be the key issue, and it harkens a lot to, to, to what I was saying before about using landscapes as a prism so that we can change how those indicators are formulated or viewed. And that is part of the work that we could do specifically in terms of that question, but in parallel to that, we're going to have to start working on implementation on the ground. And what we need to do is create that virtuous cycle going forward so that there is some kind of an adaptive management or, or a, a cycle that feeds what we're learning back into it. And there's other governance mechanisms that came out of Rio. I'm not sure how effective, quite honestly, they will be in that. But I think it's up to governments, up to parties, up to private sector, to other stakeholders to have that vetting process or that review process to see how robust it really is in practice. Thank you, Paula. Peter. Yeah, very, very quickly. Um, now I will first answer to your second question here. <laughs> what do we do with what's missing? I would, I would actually turn that question around and say, who decides what's missing? Because that's the kind of question that has led to the pro proliferation of all sorts of different targets and indicators in the past. Because everybody wants their indicator in there. So if you ask the question, what's missing, you will get too many replies. I suggest we ask, we ask it somewhat differently to, to get a more constructive discussion going on that. Um, uh, and that connects to uh, my, my comment to the first question, which is now on, on the screen. What specific action is needed? I would say reality check. I was in a previous life responsible for the forest indicator to the MDGs, and I participated in all sorts of meetings with the UN Statistics Division with, with people from all sorts of agencies within the intergovernmental system. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a, a good and necessary exercise as such, but it pretty sad, was pretty sad to see how little connection there was between that work and what was going on on the ground. So I hope we're not repeating that now, and I hope that we can make a reality check and figure out what do we, what do we really need to know, what is really important to know, and, and that uh, just because we have 17 goals and I don't know how many targets, that doesn't mean that we need even more indicators. I would say 8 to 10 indicators would be sufficient, and that would be good communication too. Solamente creo que tenemos que tomar consciente, conciencia que el momento ya está en etapa intergubernamental. ¿no? Eh, los aportes que podamos tener como países se tienen que canalizar eh, a través de Nueva York, de nuestra delegación allá en Nueva York. Y en Nueva York tenemos una cantidad, eh, bueno, diferentes asociaciones de países, porque trabajamos con pronunciamientos en bloque. Entonces, yo creo que la que hacer hasta septiembre, bueno, hacer que cada país desarrolle me mecanismos de consulta interna para que sus posiciones nacionales realmente reflejen lo que se está pretendiendo hacer con este monitoreo de y la definición de objetivos y metas. Entonces, sí es importante saber en qué etapa del periodo estamos, de qué manera la sociedad civil, la organización académica, la cooperación internacional debería estar canalizando sus posturas en diferentes temáticas. Yo creo que el gran aporte de este proceso es, y creo que ha sido un territorio ya ganado, que el enfoque, la dimensión ambiental del desarrollo sostenible está más equilibrada respecto al enfoque económico y al enfoque social. Entonces, creo que ese es el gran logro de este proceso eh, de definición de ODS y de esta agenda 
a positive meeting. Thank you, Sonia. We're needing to, uh, to wrap up, because most of our panelists need to go on to another session, and you do as well. I'm going to take one more very quick comment, please. Um, do you have somebody? Okay. And then maybe one or two panelists can, can have a response. Um, hello, sure, I'm please. Andres Hildebrand from the Ministry, Peruvian Ministry of Environment. I would like to congratulate all of you for your quite interesting presentations. I have a question about RET, actually. Mm. And it goes, and it has to do with the fact that what I find sometimes difficult with SDGs is how is to link too strongly rights, people's rights, to implementation of, well, climate change policies based on scientific evidence. I'll speak about red uh, and between and the conflict between local level and national level. There, there seems to be like two groups in red: the ones who favorize, the, the ones who support a strong national component to supervise the results of red, and then the other ones who actually are more focused on communities and say, well, communities should be able to manage themselves, should, should be able to empower themselves, and so forth. That's okay, but RET is also about money. And according to any basic principle of check and balances, if there is money and profit involved, how is the people who, well, who are going to make the profit also responsible of evaluating the results? So um, I, 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 find, I find, for me, that's one of the big problems with RET. And also, you could say there is some sort of contradiction between equity and profit and efficiency within RET. Um, and the thing is, how can you solve this issue if you are claiming that the right of a community to supervise is, is a basic right of empowerment and so forth? Well, there is a contradiction with a national level who should control, actually, and make coherent data. I mean, if you have many local examples, you know, many local methods, how do you actually integrate that into your national contributions? Because you, have, you, you need coherent metrics within a country. And if it's within a region, even better. So that will be my, my remark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone want to respond to that? I hear you. I yeah, I'd like to respond. I think it's very interesting questions. Because the other question that comes into that is that what and how are we going to use the SDGs? Are we going to go through each of these uh, 17 goals so many targets and try to measure and get very tired in measuring? Or are we going to do the actions? And I'll put here the red as one of the driver that will be put and be done. And when it is done, look into the check into that sustainable development goals. Does it go against those elements? And how we do that in the Indonesia, we said that in, in Indonesia, red is beyond carbon and more than forest. So the indicators that we are using in terms of operation on the ground is basically not only emission reduction, but also equitable economic well-being of the people, of the people that is the sports dwelling. So basically your development needs to be more equitable than before. And then the third is ecological sustainability. So if a district in the red performance is only good in emission reduction, no score, okay? If there is it's not it's emission reduction and also the social equity, but ec uh, the ec ecological balance is uh, affected, is bad, no score. Okay, so basically you can start getting the money from emissions, but also from livelihood, from new way of getting the income, and then you do that and score the jurisdiction based on that, and only reward when the balance is okay. So we set with each of the district a balanced scorecard, and that scorecard is what is going to be implemented. It's not easy, but it's the right thing. Now, if we do that already and we match to the sustainable development goals, does it meet the eradication of poverty? Does it meet this and that? And then we can say, yes, it scores correct. Okay, I think I'm trying to answer your red questions in the SDG context. Thank you very much, Bahira. You brought it around in a nice circle, highlighting the, the need to look at the, the holistic look at the uh, sets of benefits and what RED needs to deliver, as well as the SDGs. We're totally out of time. I'd like to thank again the panelists and give them one last round of applause, please. Thank you.